Ladies and gentlemen, St Edmund's witness. Little is known of the life of King Edmund because the devastation caused by the Vikings throughout East Anglia destroyed any books or records which may have referred to him. We do, however, know some of the history of this King of East Anglia. Edmund was born circa 840 on the 20th of November, now St Edmund's Day, and ascended to the throne whilst still a boy in 855, his coronation being at Berna, probably modern day Bure St Mary in Suffolk. He died at the hands of the Danes in 869 or 870. He is the patron saint of kings, pandemics, torture victims, and of course, wolves. There are many different accounts of his death, and tonight we're going to share one of those with you. When I was a lad, King Edmund chose me as his standard bearer. Me. A young boy of just 17. I never felt so proud. My family were honoured. Kept slapping me on the back and congratulating me. God, did we have a few drinks that night. I set off early the next morning full of joy and hope and pride. If I could have seen the future, I wouldn't have been so happy. According to the abbot of Fleury and Florence of Worcester, he came ex antiquorum saxonum prosopia. This apparently means he was of foreign origin and belonged to the Saxons of the old continent. This legend later expanded to a much richer tale and told of his old Saxon parentage, his birth at Nuremberg, his nomination as successor to Offa, king of the Angles, and his landing at Unstanton to claim his kingdom. Of the next 14 years of Edmund's life, nothing is known. But in 869 or 870, the Danes marched south from their winter camp at York and took up their quarters at Thetford. According to an account by Bishop Asser in 895, Edmund engaged them in a fierce battle. But the Danes, under the leadership of Ugo Ragnarsson and Ivar the Boneless, won the day, killed Edmund, and remained in possession of the battlefield. The alternative, and more popular version, was written about 100 years later, again by the abbot of Fleury. Fleury's version of events claims Edmund refused to meet the Danes in battle himself, preferring instead to die a martyr's death. When the battle ended, so many of us were lost. Danes showed no mercy. They butchered every last man they could find. I was lucky to escape with my life. I'd never seen such savagery. I ran as fast as I could and hid in the forest. I'd been cut by a sword slash. That scar has healed over the years. The scars in my mind never will. As I watched from the trees, I saw them drag my king through the baying crowd of drunken Danes. They tied him to a tree. But he stayed calm and dignified. He prayed to God for the strength to endure his pain. Edmund was a Christian. He was always quoting this or that from his faith or some prophet or other. I remember him telling us that fighting was bad for all men and that we should strive to live in harmony with each other, no matter what or who our gods were. Bastard Danes never saw it like that. It upset some people, you know. I mean, preaching peace and harmony. I thought he lost his mind. I would have gone soft in the head. 
What's a king for if not to lead his army into battle, defend his people? As I watched, I could see that my king had been beaten. There was dried blood around his mouth and his eyes were swollen and his face black and blue. But he stood in defiance, as tall as his broken body would allow. His tormentors screamed at him and beat him again and again. I've carried that guilt all my life. Why didn't I help him? Why didn't I even try? I was afraid. I carried that shame too. Shame and guilt. Edmund's refusal to renounce his faith or have his kingdom held as vassal to the Danish heathen overlords dates from comparatively soon after the event. Abel Fleury, 944 to 1004, heard the tale from Dunstan, who was told the events surrounding Edmund's death by Edmund's own standard bearer. According to the standard bearer, this battle took place at Hoxton, some 20 miles east of Thetford, and the king's body would ultimately be interred at Beordricksworth, modern day Bury St Edmunds. As I watched my king being beaten, a great roar erupted from the, from the crowd, and their leaders pushed their way forward to Edmund, Uba Ragnarsson and Ivar the Bonus. Uba took Edmund's head in his hands, drew back his whole body, and smashed his forehead into Edmund's face. The king fell, only the ropes holding him. Ivar called for buckets of water to be thrown to bring Edmund back to life. I could watch no longer. I turned to run, but there, straight ahead of me, was the biggest wolf I'd ever seen. I panicked and let out a cry of help. And the Danish guard must have heard me and came rushing through the woods. The wolf slid past me, looking me in the eye for a moment. Oh, ma'am, what's the case, Then turned towards the Dane, fixing his eyes now on him. He let out such a deep growl, it ran through my whole body. I waited that day never moved so fast in his entire life. The wolf returned, looked me in the eyes again for a moment, then disappeared into the woods. I stood motionless. Edmund's voice brought me back to my senses. He was shouting, Jesus is my saviour. God will not forsake me. Uba and Eva were screaming at him. One of the guards translating their words. Denounce your false god. Over and over. But Edmund would not yield. He fixed his eyes on Uba and screamed, I will never yield only to my God. I am Christ's warrior and you are all down to hell. In the years following the death of St Edmund, his shrine became one of the most famous in the whole of England and his reputation spread throughout Europe. Although we don't actually know the date of Edmund's canonization, Archdeacon Herman states that it took place during the reign of King Athelstan, somewhere between the years 19 924 and 939, and churches dedicated to his memory are found all over England, 
the current total being 78. Those are the last words I heard him say. Eva summoned two of his guards forward. I didn't know what's going on, but I was soon to find out. The two soldiers paced 20 steps from Edmund, turned and raised their bows. Edmund never flinched. He stood proud and brave awaiting the inevitable. You could have heard a pin drop. And then whoosh, both arrows struck home. Edmund's face fell to his chest. But that wasn't enough. They shot him again and again, each time bringing a cheers and applause from the mob until Eva shouted something in that babbling tongue of theirs and they fell silent. There are calls from some in the English community to reinstate Edmund as a true patron saint of England and for him to be reinstated as such. It has been suggested that the current St George was a 13th century import by Norman descended monarchs who were trying to eradicate any trace of Edmund from English folk history and that the current flag, red cross on a field of white, be replaced with the flag of St Edmund, white cross on a field of green. Then, the most awful thing I've ever seen. They hacked off his head. Again and again they struck until Edmund's head and body were separated. I was physically sick. Strength went from me and I, I sank to my knees. towards the trees and hurled it into the forest. Everyone fell silent as they watched it arc through the air. They started pulling down the tents and packing away their things and making to leave. When they'd gone, I rushed back to the village, brought men back, and we took Edmund's body down from the tree. We wrapped it in a sheet, and we went looking for his head. We spent five or six days in the forest, searching. Then one man came rushing towards me, shouting, Wolf! Wolf! He pointed to a clearing and then disappeared. The others turned to run too, but I shouted, Hold yourselves! I moved forward cautiously. And there, in a clearing, was the wolf, with Edmund's head between his huge front paws. He looked at me again. This time, I felt no fear. The wolf gently picked Edmund's head up, padded forward, and laid it at my feet. According to legend then, 
Edward was killed being tied to a tree, shot to death with arrows, and finally decapitated and his head thrown into the forest so that his entire body could not be buried, a form of mockery to his people, perhaps. When his body was recovered, but without a head, eyewitnesses reported that the head was lost in the forest. For several days they searched for the head, shouting, Where are you, friend? And the head would reply, Here, here, here. After almost a week of searching, they found Edmund's head in the possession of a great grey wolf, clasped between its paws. The wolf, sent by God to protect the head from the dangers of the forest, was starving, but did not eat the head for all the days it was lost. I sensed that the wolf wanted me to pick the head up. The others around me moved forward too. I could see how frightened they were, but this was their king too. The wolf then moved a short distance away and lay down on the ground. His eyes ever watchful. I beckoned to the two men carrying Edmund's body to come forward. They parted the sheet and I reunited Edmund's bloodied head with his broken body and we set off for the village. The wolf walked beside me, his ears pricked, fully alert guarding his king. The wolf followed along as if he were tame, and when they reached the village, he turned and disappeared back into the trees. The king's loyal subjects buried Edmund's holy body as best they could, and set a marker over his grave. Many years passed, but eventually peace came to the kingdom. The people joined together and built a church worthy of such a saint at the marker of Edmund's burial place and many miracles were said to have happened there. When the church was completed, Edmund's body was carried with public honour and laid to rest in the church. The following extract is from the preface to the Anglo-Saxon version by Elfric of Eynsham. Then there was a great miracle. Edmund was as sound as when he was alive, with a clean body, and his neck, which previously was severed, was healed. It was as if a red silken thread around his neck showed men how he was slain. Also, the wounds which the cruel heathens made with frequent spear shots to his body were healed by the heavenly God. And Edmund lies thus uncorrupted down to the present day, awaiting resurrection and the eternal glory. His body, which lies undecayed, tells us that he lived without fornication in this world and with a clean life journeyed to Christ. A certain widow named Oswin lived near the Holy Shrine and prayed and feasted there many years. She would cut the hair of the saint each year and trim his nails chastely with love and place those holy relics in the shrine on the altar. Then the local people honored the saint by believing in him and Bishop Theodore very greatly honored him with gifts of gold and silver. One night, Eight accursed thieves came to the venerable saint. They wanted to steal the treasure which men had brought thither and craftily figured out how they might enter. One struck at the hasps with a hammer and one of them fouled about with a file. One also dug under the door with a spade. One with a ladder tried to unlock the window. But they levered poorly and fared 
badly that the saint miraculously bound them stiffly and each as he stood with his tools so that none of them might succeed in their crime nor stir from there. They stood firstly until morning. Men were amazed at that. How the men hung, one on a ladder, one stooped to dig, and each firmly bound in his task. <coughs> the thieves were all then brought to the bishop, and he commanded that they hang them all on the high gallows. But he was not mindful of how the merciful God commanded through his prophets the words which stand here. Eos, qui de cunta, ad mortem, erwere, ne cessas. Always redeem those whom man condemns to death. And the holy canons also forbid to the ordained, both bishops and priests, to judge concerning thieves, because it is not fitting for those who are chosen to the service of God to condemn any man to death, especially if the criminals are Christians. After Bishop Theodred examined his book, he repented grievously that he had so cruelly condemned those unhappy thieves and lamented it always until the end of his days. He asked the people eagerly that they fast with him for three entire days, asking Almighty God that he should have mercy upon him. In that country was a man named Leofstam, rich in worldly things, but ignorant of God. He wrote to the saint with exceeding arrogance and insolently ordered that the holy saint be shown to him so that he might see whether Edmund was whole. But as soon as he saw the saint's body, he went mad and raged cruelly and ended wretchedly in an evil death. This is similar to that which the pious Pope Gregory related in his narrative about the holy Laurentius who lies in Rome, that men, both good and evil, wanted to examine how he lay, but God restrained them in such manner that seven men died all at one time at the examination. Then others, human shortcomings, stopped examining the saint. Many miracles concerning Holy Edmund were heard about in popular parlance, which we will not put into writing here, but everyone knew of them. Concerning this saint, it is evident, and concerning others likewise, that God Almighty, who preserves St. Edmund's body until the great day, can resurrect that man again, uncorrupted by the earth, even though he comes from the earth. It is appropriate that man honour the holy places of the worthy saints, those servants of God in Christ's service, and furnish them properly because the saint is greater than any man can conceive. The English are not deprived of the Lord's saints, because in England lie such holy saints as this holy king, and Cuthbert the Blessed, and St. Ethelthrith the Teely, and also her sister, all sound in body, all concerning confirming the faith. There are also many other English saints who work many miracles as is widely known, in praise of the Almighty in whom they believe. Christ announces through men, his greater saints, that he who makes such miracles is Almighty God. But Christ announces to men where true faith exists when he works such miracles widely throughout the earth. We never saw the wolf again. But I will always remember him. And I know that he was sent by God to protect his kingdom and his people. Our saint. Our king. Our Edmund. Edmund.